get no rest No, no I've been down so long That my mind can't get no rest No, no This ain't easy, darling Cause the devil's on my trail I've been running so long That my feet don't work no more Oh yeah I've been running so long That my feet don't work no more Oh no It ain't easy darling When the devil's on my trail Oh yeah Welcome to another episode of Six Feet Apart with Sean and TJ. I'm your host, Sean Mooningham, Executive Director here at Felix E. Martin Jr. Hall, along with my co-host and uh, partner in Artistic Crimes, Technical Director here, Mr. TJ T. Today's episode is brought to you by Stellions, Greenville Tourism, Central Screen Printing, and TVA. And we are honored to have today as our guest, Greenville County Judge Executive, Curtis McGee. Judge, welcome. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I, I appreciate you gentlemen and thank you for having me on. We're glad to have you. My pleasure. It's uh, when you ever in a million years thought when you ran for office that you would be uh, encountering a situation like this while you, were, uh, <laughs> while you were there. I'm sure not. You know, I think there are a lot of people that when they were running for office had uh, in, in their wildest imagination couldn't uh, think of some of these things happening like we're experiencing across the country today. I, we were here back in March, and yeah. we got word that uh, this was on a Wednesday, I think. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that uh, one of the colleges in the state was closing and sending everybody home and doing the rest of the semester online. And we thought, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. And then the following Monday, we were out of school and haven't been back, and everything was, you know, the world sort of shut down. And it's amazing just how quickly that all happened. Yeah, cert certainly, we've we've heard many people say and use the words unprecedented times, and these certainly are. And to know where we're going from here is all still up in the air. What I've what I've felt from the beginning is that somehow in this great nation, in our great community, we find a way to work through this. We're doing that. The, the times have been unpleasant, and certainly. From an economic perspective, our, our businesses have been hit terribly hard, but uh, many of them are going to recover, and, and uh, we're, we're going to keep moving in the right direction until we get through this. Absolutely. We've, we've been fortunate, we've said this, that you know, we've still maintained our jobs, still getting paid. We're, you know, our families are healthy, and so we've been very fortunate, very blessed. We realize that many haven't, and we don't want to make light of the situation or sure. our, our focus away from, from the impact that it's had on so many people uh, in their health and in their finances and in their, in their lives in total. Their mental stability and just, yeah. So well, exactly, and affecting people in so many different ways, of course, from an economic perspective, and I think everyone senses that, and, and fortunately, we, even people like yourself, you know, you acknowledge it, even though some of us haven't been uh, impacted by it so much personally, we know people that have. Yeah, I think we're and, all connected here in this in this community. Exactly. Uh, and so we we hurt for our our friends and our neighbors. Uh, and we do when they hurt. And then there's so many things too that people have experienced that that some of us might not think about. Um, you know, I've heard it alluded to, and I've made some remarks myself about our high school seniors and how how as a graduating class, it's it was different for them than it's been for classes for the past decades and uh, it's been been a painful time for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons yeah, we we did an episode with uh, superintendent Robbie Davis and one of the things we talked about was the community support right uh, for this senior class you know people really uh, giving of their time and of their resources to make sure that they were able to have a graduation that they were honored in different ways because it, it was such sure such a strange uh, situation and ending to their high school career. Yeah, I appreciate he and the staff at our school system, from the bus drivers, cafeteria workers, educators, 
those that work at the Board of Education because that's another uh, area where community's been really impacted and sometimes we may not stop to think about folks like that as we should. But uh, I don't know if Mr. Davis mentioned this or not. He's such a humble, humble person. And uh, in my opinion, I, I have a great admiration for him. I'll just say that. And, uh, but I know a lot of children were fed through the, you know, through oh, yeah. the spring yeah. because normally they would be having their lunches at school. Mm -hmm. And with parents, many of whom were continuing to work, parents and guardians, I know the school system really worked diligently to stay connected to our kids, and, and you have to applaud that. That was pretty pretty great. He mentioned that, that program would continue through August at least. Oh, good. Yeah. So, That's good. Uh, uh, amazing work that was done by everyone involved with that. Well, we, we like to call our uh, our getting to know you segment uh, Bridging the Gap and, and getting a little closer than six feet uh, with, uh, with our guests. And so uh, give us a little bit of your background. What got you into public service and uh, what have been some of the highlights of and some of the challenges at that time. Well, oddly enough, my, my first thought of public service came when I was about eight or ten years old. And I was playing outside at my grandparents' house. That's where I spent a lot of my, my childhood days and, and pretty much grew up there. My grandfather uh, was born in Todd County in uh, pardon me, 1898. My grandmother was born there in 1902 and moved to Muhlenberg County in the early to mid 40s. I think it was 1944 when they came here to Muhlenberg County. And then uh, they were living out on Kennedy Road in the early 60s. I was born in 1963. And I was outside playing one day. I don't, I don't know for sure how old I was, but I would guess eight or 10 years old. And I don't remember what I was playing. Could have been, could have been cops and robbers. I really don't know. But I remember I was standing underneath a big tree and for some reason, the thought came to me that I was going to be sheriff someday. And I never got that out of my mind. I, 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 I never thought of it again for many years seriously, but I always remembered that moment. And again, I can only assume that I was playing something that must have been connected to that. But as a child, I thought, I'm going to be sheriff someday. And so years went by and um, began uh, in, in ministry. And so that thought left me. I never, I never, I never forgot that time, but um, there was a, a point where I never dreamed that I would become a Muhlenberg County Sheriff. And then, as I was going going on through ministry, I was asked to be chaplain for the sheriff's office and developed a drug prevention program mm -hmm. uh, that became pretty widely recognized. And I really enjoyed getting into our schools and various uh, facets of our community to talk about how drugs were impacting our community and how they were impacting this nation and uh, started explaining to children, I know you're hearing a lot of just say no, but I'm going to tell you why to say no and how to say no. And I want to make this as easy as possible for you because sometimes in life there can be a lot of pressure. So I was passionate about that. And then uh, after I'd been doing that a few years, this kind of came back to the surface of my mind, running for public office. And I, I gave it a lot of thought consideration and after 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 that i decided to run for public office and was fortunate enough to be elected by the people in 2010 and so i served two terms as muhlenberg county sheriff and then in 2018 was elected as county drug executive but it, it went back to that time as a child where uh, and i and i know that's pretty odd but I, i've never forgotten it could take you now probably within three or four feet of where i was standing when that happened can you imagine going back and having a conversation with that eight or 10 year old yeah. version of yourself and saying, hey, we did it. Yeah, there you go. So and I've done that. I've done that a number of times. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I love Muhlenberg County. I'm glad I live here. This is such a great community. And, and, you know, I appreciate what you all are doing to just keep our community connected with this programming that you're doing. It's, it's awesome. And, and we have a lot of people just like you two in Muhlenberg County that are so passionate about Muhlenberg County continuing to move in the right direction. So anyhow, I love my, love my, love my job, love being sheriff. Uh, uh, I, I really enjoy being judge executive, even during these difficult times. I'm, I'm very positive about my job, what and, did I you, and I love life. What did you, you know, probably for all intents and purposes, you could have been sheriff as long as you wanted to. You know, I mean, I, I, I fully believe that. Was it the thought of a different challenge? Was it wanted to try something else? Was it did you see another area where you thought you could be of service and help in judge executive? Well, to, to some degree, uh, all of the above. And thank thank you for that comment. And again, um, 
I guess candidly, I, I don't anticipate I'll ever have any job that I will enjoy as much as I enjoyed being sheriff. Uh, I look forward every morning to getting up, and often I'd stay out late at night because I loved what I was doing. But, um, you know, my age was impacting me some, and sheriffing is a tough, tough job. Law enforcement is a very difficult job. Yes, sir. And so, you know, it kind of starts weighing on you. And then also I was seeing some things that I felt like I could do for our community from a positive standpoint and perspective as judge executive. And the same nudge that I had in my heart to run for sheriff came to me in regard to running for judge executive, and I felt like it's what I needed to do, so so here I am. For people who don't know, can you explain a little bit more about the job of judge executive, exactly what you oversee and, and what uh, what the day-to-day -day sure. type of well, activities are? Any anytime you're in public service, you know, communicating with people and listening to people, I think, are very key. I was talking to a student from the University of Indiana just just prior to coming in here, had a Zoom meeting, and they interviewed me about my job as a ju judge executive, and that was the question they asked. And and I think a lot of public service, whether it's judge executive or any other position, is remembering that you are a servant to the people. They don't serve you, you serve them. And you know, our forefathers, it was by the people and for the people. That's what government's supposed to be. That's right. Not, not by the money or for special interest, it's by the people and for the people. And so I think listening to people, communicating with them is certainly important. And as a judge executive, uh, dealing with personnel and budget issues, of course, are always very important. Sometimes I feel like I'm the, I guess, like a human service manager for, you know, the county employees. I, I'm not, but in, in some, some respects, it certainly seems that way sometimes. You're the... Uh... The one man HR department. Uh, that, that's probably, that's, probably that's feels it. that way so, at times. And, and of course, we have our department heads. So in in county government across the Commonwealth, um, in in my thinking, it's a good setup because you have the judge executive that works with other office holders like the sheriff and the jailer and the county court clerk, the county attorney, and others. And then you have department heads like your road department supervisor for county road and your dispatch director. Um, in our case, the ag center. A director, so you work closely with those people to make sure that jobs are are getting done, and uh, it's important for all of us, whether in in county government, whether you're a department head or an elected official, to remember that it goes back to serving the people. What do the people expect out of me? And obviously, they want you to do your best. And they want you to be as fair as you possibly can. Sometimes the decisions we make are painful. They were painful. I had to make painful decisions as a sheriff, and I've had to do that as a judge executive. And I guess those decisions never stop coming at you. And again, you just try to be as fair as you can and do the best that you can. And I know when I was elected as judge executive, my dad was very ill. He had been diagnosed with a small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, and his prognosis wasn't good. Um, he voted, and after we talked some about uh, him being able to get to the courthouse to vote, he said, Curtis, I, I feel like and, and uh, believe, hope you're going to get elected. And he said, but if you do, you're going to have some tough decisions to make. And he said, my advice to you is you do the best you can, make the best decisions you can, and then please try not to worry about it. So following the first part of my dad's advice has been easy, but not right. worrying about it is sometimes very difficult. Right. Uh, because there are a lot of people that are depending on you. And if you make the wrong decision, then you potentially let a lot of people down. So kind of a tough job sometimes, but I still enjoy doing it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's some good wisdom from uh, from Dad. Yeah, good wisdom for, from a good right. man. Yeah, absolutely. What's uh, I know we could probably look at the last few months as probably the biggest challenge since you've been in office, uh, obviously, but uh, what's, what's been maybe a couple of highlights uh, in the two years since you were elected? Well, you know, just uh, there, there's been so many of them. I don't really know where to start there, but every day, every day is like a highlight for me. And there are, in, in the last few months, have been extremely difficult from the COVID-19 perspective and then the TVA funding. And then we have, you know, the protests that are going on across the country. And we had one here yesterday, and it was very peaceful. It was such a, I thought, a great demonstration of American spirit, both from the perspective of the protesters and the law enforcement community. I walked over there just to, you know, see what was going on and to talk to some of the folks and the people that were protesting were doing it 
uh, in my opinion and estimation, for the most part, in a very positive manner. And I saw law enforcement mingling with those people. And the relationship and the connection was pretty yeah. powerful. Saw the, the exact same thing. We both attended, and okay. my daughter is, you know, it's no Delaney. She's just got a huge heart. And she was dying to attend. She wanted to participate. Mm -hmm. And Kelly and I talked about it, and I said, you know, I'm going to go and just see how it's being done. And if we feel safe enough, then I want to come back and get her. And we were there for a little while, and I left, and I went and got Delaney and came back. And talking about law enforcement, I got to talk to Chief Harvey for just a minute. And I just thanked him for what he and the Sheriff's Department were doing. Sure. Because um, they were. They were interacting and talking yes. to people and and building some relationship there. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was absolutely great. It was exactly what you have in mind for a protest sure. for your First Amendment right to be, right? Exactly. It was exactly what I think it should have been. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, was, I was very pleased that we you know, had some students there and wanted to make sure they were safe and okay and, right. and, uh, and lend our support and could not have been more positively impacted by the relationships that we saw. Exactly. Seeing law enforcement uh, officers and a lot of, local of every people. color, and and local people of, of every color interacting and mingling and, and hugging each other and and forgetting the six feet distance. Uh, but you know, a lot of people wearing masks, and sure. so people were mindful of those sure. things. But protesters bringing coolers of ice water and and sharing them with the law enforcement uh, officers and and law enforcement officers, you know, reaching out and and interacting with so it was it couldn't have gone better i, I appreciate I what their what the message is mm -hmm. uh we're very fortunate here to have the support of law enforcement uh and a good relationship with the community sure. uh, so there's always room for improvement and we don't want to turn a blind eye to what's going on in a bigger picture uh, but uh you know i think the voices uh, that were heard yesterday were, were met with positive ears I think that I think those are great observations, and I that was the same kind of experience I had. I told someone when I left, I felt more like I'd been to church than to protest. It was really <laughs> yeah. a moving experience, yeah. I thought. And and I'm a big, you know, as a former sheriff, I am a huge supporter of law enforcement. And but but as you said, we know there's always room for improvement in every area of life. And and uh, and and racism does exist in America. We can say that it doesn't. We can pretend it doesn't. But but, but it does. It does. And so there are, are people that, that have a voice that want to express that voice. And I thought yesterday the expressions were just as positive as they could have been. And our local law enforcement community, I, in, in my estimation, is off the chart. As far as their ethics go and the way they perform and their professionalism, I think they do a wonderful job. And again, I think law enforcement as a whole in this country does a wonderful job. And, and, but again, there's always room for improvement in, in, in every area of life. And people have that right to protest. And I don't, I don't know how they could have done that in a more uh, positive manner than what they did yesterday. In a more American manner. American manner. It, it felt was, very American. It did. It and really I wish did. the media, you know, the ones, the same medias that have been showing all of the yeah. rioting and violence, I wish we could see more of this kind of stuff because I've got a feeling there's a lot of what happened in Greenville yesterday going on across this country that's not making national news. I would agree. I would definitely agree. And I was glad to see that it, it was a local protest. You know, I was, I was sort of, one of my concerns was that right. outside forces would come in and try and stir up trouble. Because I, I know, I have a pretty good grasp of the people here, I feel. And so I knew what I felt like was going to be the, the spirit that was there, but I didn't want to see it impacted uh, by outside forces. So that was nice to see as well. Yeah. So. With all of our problems, COVID-19 and all that's going on, still still in my opinion certainly the greatest nation on the earth and uh, i'm proud to be an american i think that's a good spot to uh, step too. away for a second Absolutely. and uh, thank our sponsors again today's episode is brought to you by greenville tourism by tva by stallions and by central screen printing back in a minute with more with newberg county judge executive curtis mcgee
Welcome back, and uh, thanks again to those sponsors and, and all of our sponsors uh, every season here at Felix C. Martin Jr. Hall. We just wrapped up our eighth season. Uh, looking forward to the ninth season. We'll be announcing that soon. A little different due to current restrictions, but uh, yes. some exciting things uh, still lie ahead. So we're speaking today with Curtis McGee, Judge Executive here in Muhlenberg County. And uh, Curtis, we talked a lot about good things that are happening uh, in the county and positive things that we've seen despite uh, a bit of chaos. Uh, Globally, so, <laughs> a bit of chaos. A bit globally. of chaos. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I like, like the way I phrase that. Yeah, I uh, That's pretty good. I know you'd mentioned off camera that um, a lot of good groundwork was laid by a task force that was formed here locally. You want to talk about that a little more? When, when, uh, when, when we realized that COVID nineteen was going to be significant, just just days after we started hearing about COVID nineteen. The next thing you're hearing about is restaurants closing down and businesses closing down in other states. And so when we realized that uh, Kentucky was going to be impacted by that and Muhlenberg County at some point was going to be impacted by that, I contacted our mayors, some community leaders, uh, including people from the law enforcement community, um, the school system, health department, hospital, some of our local clinics, uh, mental health, and I asked them if they would come together for a community meeting. And at that time, we didn't know so much about social distancing. Again, this was very early on. So we had several people to come to the physical courtroom. And just minutes before we met, I contacted Greg Armstrong. Greg was retired staff command sergeant major for the National Guard. And I talked to Greg quite a bit about some county projects. And I knew that he, he, I knew, that he knew organization and structure and strategy. And, and I called, called uh, Greg Armstrong and I said, I'm going to really put you on the spot, but I would like for us to develop a COVID-19 task force and I need a director for that. And here's why I'm asking you to do it. And I mentioned some of the things that I just, just mentioned to you gentlemen. And uh, I said, could you at least think about that? And he did not hesitate. He said, I don't have to think about it. I'll be glad to help. So from that day, he was our director and he did a phenomenal job of working with some people. He recruited uh, Jamie Wells to help with media task, and he recruited some other people to become a part of that task force, in addition to the ones that we initially identified. And they gathered information, they got that information out to the community in a calming way, as calm as, calmly as possible, and just did a good job of communicating with healthcare and law enforcement. And there's even a subsection of that com committee right now that's working very hard to make sure that we're doing everything we can do for our businesses as they're reopening and recovering. And so I just I applaud them for the work that they've done. They were exceptional in getting us a good foundation to deal with this in a positive perspective. Of course, the prison brought a lot of uh, publicity to Muhlenberg County. And what we saw across the nation, obviously, with COVID-19 is once it got into a an isolated area, whether it was a nursing home or prison, whatever the case might be, then of course it was highly contagious, so it quickly spread. So it was very unfortunate for uh, our folks at Green River Correctional uh, Facility that that happened. But apart from those numbers, the numbers in our community have been uh, very good compared to counties uh, this size. So our health department director and a lot of folks worked really hard and are continuing to work really hard in regard to uh, COVID-19. And Muhlenberg County has responded beautifully. It was like some other things we deal with. It was painful. Um, I implemented a curfew at one point. It wasn't real popular with some people. I, I thought at the time it was the right thing to do, and so I did it. I guess in this lifetime, I may never know how much it helped or if it helped, but certainly at the time, I believed that it was the right thing to do. And there were a lot of counties that implemented curfews, uh, you know, around the state. Uh, or I know of, of some in our area that did at least. So people worked wonderfully together. I, re I referred to our high school seniors moments ago. That was the community I never had one complaint from during COVID-19. <laughs> Any time I heard from them, it was always positive. And they were just fantastic. That's through wonderful, this. Yeah, and if anybody should have been complaining, in my thinking, you know, them as much as anyone, Right. If I was if I was 17 or 18 years old and graduating from high school, uh, you know, it'd been difficult to maintain social distancing from your friends and those type of things. But and when we talked about the curfew, somebody somebody said to me, "Well, you ought to just do it for for kids that are 17 and under." 
And my response was, that's not who we're having the problems with. Right. You know, right. they were great and they still are. And that class of 2020, God bless them. They are off the chart great in my book. Absolutely. You mentioned uh, earlier some good news in terms of numbers uh, here in the last few days, in terms of cases. Uh, mm -hmm. So Yeah, I, uh, I'd heard from the health department director the day before yesterday and there were no new cases. And then uh, I actually messaged her last evening uh, a little reluctantly, I was like, well, I think no good, no news is good news. And But I went ahead and messaged her and I said, uh, Miss Bethel, any new cases today? No, no, no new cases. So that's two days in a row. And we've not seen many, many days like that since COVID-19 came good. to our community. So I'm hoping that this is, you know, uh, an indicator of where we're going to be going with this. Right. It'll be interesting to see. And I know we'll all be keeping a close eye on it as things start to open back up. And... Uh, to see yes. if, if those numbers uh, start to trend the other direction. Right. But uh, we'll, we'll be hopeful that people are maintaining distance and, and you know, all the things that we've Washing learned over the last couple exactly. of months uh, as important ways to help combat this. So, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of what we're doing since COVID-19 came to our country, we should have been doing previously as far as washing our hands goes, especially. Yep. And, uh, you know, because it's not COVID-19, it's the flu, it's, it's the something. Flu, it's the cold. We've, we've known for something. decades that it's yeah. important, you know, to keep your hands washed. And and uh, so so those things, we've, and, and, and a lot of it's good common sense. And I think people are going to, I think people are going to use that going forward. I personally am glad to see some things opening back up. Our businesses were struggling oh, yeah. terribly bad. They continue to struggle. Many of them do. And uh, so... I, I believe Muhlenberg Countyans will be supportive of Muhlenberg County businesses. Certainly, we encourage that because they 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 have a pretty big mountain to climb as they move forward. And we know that uh, talking about businesses and the unemployment rate in the country is skyrocketing. It's higher than it was even during the Great Depression. And part of that's population is bigger, but the majority of it is there's more businesses closed down True. than there was then. It, how how have our numbers gone in the county? You know, as far as I, I don't know go. what our number presently is, but I know that prior to COVID nineteen, Muhlenberg County had one of, if not the highest, unemployment rate in Western Kentucky, uh, and it's been that way for, for a, a number of a number of months. And when the coal mine coal mining industry started to diminish, then obviously that had a big impact on Muhlenberg County. We were a county back in the late seventies that was the number one coal producing county in the world. And historically, when the coal industry was good, economically speaking, Muhlenberg County was good. When the coal industry is not doing well, we are not doing well. And so um, following along um, with, that, with that thought, Muhlenberg County has struggled with our uh, unemployment rate being, being high. So our economic lifeline is going to be industry uh, coming to Muhlenberg County. Right now, that's pretty difficult because there's not a lot of new industries developing, not only in Kentucky, but across this nation because of the lack of, of, of demand. But going forward, I think we'll see some positive things there. Uh, Muhlenberg County was hit hard recently by the allocated monies from TVA. I know the school board, and I don't know if Mr. Davis talked about that or not, and I don't want to talk about his area of expertise, but uh, the, the community is aware of the fact that they lost several million dollars in funding. The county lost $2.3 million in funding. And when you take a county with the kind of budget that we have, we're in property tax, we're only collecting about $1.2 million for the county. Now, there are other taxes that are being collected by Muhlenberg County that don't come back to, to us as county government. To the fiscal court. To fiscal court, yes. So, as, as and, and because of that, when you take $2.3 million out of our budget, it puts us in a tremendous strain. We saw this coming. We knew that the monies were going to be reduced. We did not know, I don't think anyone knew, how significantly those numbers would be reduced. No. But to go from $2.3 million to $500,000 is, is a huge reduction. So as a fiscal court, we're faced with uh, preparing a budget by the end of June, and it's not going to be pleasant. It's going to be, as, as I was talking about earlier on your program, you know, when you're a judge executive, you have to make some tough decisions, and I, along with our magistrates, are faced with some tough decisions right now. Because there's no way you balance a budget like we have in Muhlenberg County without making a lot of significant cuts. So we cut through the fat. We had 
fortunately for our community, we had a $1.1 million carryover, and that was huge for us. That really pushes us in the right direction in regard to preparing our budget, but we still have to cut through the fat, through the muscle, all the way down to the bone, and when you do that, it's painful. So we're talking about, you know, persons being laid off. We're talking about uh, traveling and training monies being cut, and people that are working, for example, like your sheriff's office, they need training. They have to travel, but we've had to look at that budget line by line uh, and, and make every cut we possibly could make. And again, some of those cuts were really painful. And that budget is not official yet, but we're meeting uh, and having a special fiscal court meeting today at 4 o'clock to talk more about the budget. I don't know that it will be prepared. I don't anticipate that it will be. Uh, I anticipate that we'll meet, we'll talk about the budget. If we can't adopt the budget, um, approve the budget this evening, uh, then we will recess and come back in another another day to look at the budget. Uh, a lot of people have, you know, have very good ideals. So I'm listening to people out in the community. I've met with some of our community leaders, and I've asked them, what do you do if you're in my shoes? What do you think is best for Muhlenberg County? And I've heard a lot of different ideals about taxes. And I know sometimes taxing is necessary, and increases in taxes can be necessary as well. But as a judge executive, looking at what's going on in our county with the economy the way that it is, I don't, I don't feel like a lot of people in our community can stand a new tax. Occupational tax uh, exists, I think, in all of our surrounding counties. But that's one of the things I've prided Muhlenberg County on is we don't have that here. And I think that's a big plus for us in regard to recruiting industry. It's going to make it more difficult for us to recruit people if we implement that. So creating uh, new taxes, I just don't think is ideal for Muhlenberg County, and I discourage that among our fiscal court. And I've not had anyone from the fiscal court say, hey, I think we ought to do this. Now, one thing some counties are doing across the state, and some counties near us are doing this, is they're moving their 911 fee from the landline telephones over to the water bill. Because right now, the 911 fees that are paid in Muhlenberg County are on a landline service. And we only have about 25 or 30 percent of our population that has a landline. Most everybody has a cell phone. Exactly. Most people are using a cell phone. So if you find a landline, there's a good chance it's in the senior community or it's a business. And those are the only people that are paying 911 fees. And it's expensive to operate the 911 center. Call volume's up significantly. Uh, I met with our sheriff recently. Our, our, he, he was talking to me and a couple of our magistrates, and he explained that their call volume in 2019 was up 967 more calls than they had in 2018. So we can't shut 911 down. That's an area where you really can't afford to lose people. Same thing is true with uh, first responders. Maybe people can wait a little longer to get their car license. We don't want that to happen, but it's better for them to have to wait there, I feel like, than it is for them to wait for a deputy to respond if they've got an emergency. So we're trying to trying to make good decisions there, and my recommendation to the court is that we move that fee over from the landline telephones to the water bill because almost everybody has a water meter, and that way everybody shares in that burden. And there is a possibility that that fee could increase from $3 to 4 or $5. We haven't decided yet, but we've talked about keeping it the same, transferring it over. If we keep it the same, we will lose more persons here in Muhlenberg County because, because what's happened the last several years is out of our budget, we've kept the 911 office going. Big expense to run that office. So the budget's had some surplus that's been able to use to balance that. We can't do that anymore. So the folks in Muhlenberg County are going to have to help us pay for those 911 services. So again, I think at the maximum we're talking about to people that are out in the community, if you don't have a landline fee at a maximum $60 a year, and we, and we realize that can be very difficult for people that are on a limited budget. For some of us, $60 in a year's time is not a large amount, but for some people it is. And so I'm taking that into consideration, but again, trying to make the decision that is best overall for Muhlenberg County. I know you're working to recruit. The, the map board is working to recruit. Central City is working to recruit. Sure. So, you know, Greenville, everybody's looking to recruit some kind of business or something. They're working constantly. Have you, have you gotten any good prospects or are you still? There are prospects, but again, people, people that we had been talking to prior to COVID-19, those talks have slowed down right, right. now. 
and and because right now in the last few months we've been primarily worried about keeping everyone safe as possible but um, certainly this is not off the table recruiting the industry is not off the table and one of the things that i've done as a judge i felt like uh, was helpful to muhlenberg county not only have i worked to try to recruit industry to muhlenberg county but i've tried to bridge some gaps between muhlenberg county uh, residents and people outside of the county that employ there are a lot of industries in outlying areas all the way from Bowling Green down to nearly the Tennessee line and, and deep to, down, down in Todd County where I've gone and knocked on the doors of plant managers and human resource managers and I've said tell me a little bit about what you offer and let me take that back to the people in Muhlenberg County and what I'm finding is everywhere from the Tulsa and Owensboro to uh, many of our outlying industries, they need employees. And so there are jobs that are available. We don't want people to have to drive out of Muhlenberg County. Right. But sometimes that's the best option. And, 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 and in an attempt to find gainful employment for people, I've tried to work hard in that area also. We think that uh, tourism in the county is helping a lot with our influx of revenue. Because... Uh, for me, because when I look around, we don't have a lot of industry at all. You know, we just don't. The hospital, the school district, Winston Bigford, TVA is down to basically 40 employees out there from 400 used to be. Um, but we do have a lot of stuff going for us from the standpoint of Lake Malone, this place, New Ray Amphitheater, everything that Greenville and Central City put on downtown. I mean, for a person looking to come through the summer months, you could spend three days here and do a lot of stuff and see a lot of stuff sure. that you can't really find anywhere else. You know? that, that's a that's a great point. And Muhlenberg County is beautiful. You know, most of us enjoy just getting out and riding around once in a while. And even though we see it over and over again, uh, there's some beautiful places in Muhlenberg County. So this is kind of a neat story going along with what you're saying. I've told my children about a place where I enjoy walking out on Peabody Wildlife Management Area, but it's it's an old mining road is all that it is. But I've told them over the years, hey, this is one of my favorite spots. I enjoy going there and just hanging out sometimes, maybe taking a long walk or maybe just sitting in my vehicle. So I was out there uh, maybe maybe six weeks ago or something like that, and a vehicle comes by, and I'm sitting there getting ready to watch the sunset, and uh, it's my youngest son and his wife. And they're out. <laughs> He's like, Dad, this place is great. I said, it's one of the best kept secrets in Muhlenberg County. And so I told him where an eagle's nest was at. And I said, let me take and show you something that's, I want to show you something that's pretty neat. So we drove over and there were two osprey building a nest. And they got to watch them for a while. But there's just so much here. This is, this is beautiful country. And Lake Malone, the dock trot that uh, the tourism uh, uh, commissions had last year, uh, they, I, I wasn't able to attend. I planned to go this year. They say it was a real good success. But there are things like that that we do need to capitalize on. Tourism could, could uh, and I know our tourism districts, Greenville, Central City, and Muhlenberg County Tourism Commissions, I know they work hard, and it's important that they continue to do that. The new museum over at Central City, that motorsports museum. It's wonderful, isn't it? Oh, my. I went over there for their uh, open house, and there were like, I don't know, I would guess 250 or 300 people there. And one of the neat things about it is I was looking around. Most of them I didn't know. Yeah. It was people that had come from out of the county to visit that museum and yeah. that open house. And when those people are here, they're going to stop at our convenience stores. Some of them may have stayed overnight at our hotels. They're going to eat in our restaurants. Right. So it's a big plus to bring people like that in to our community. Uh, we had some good things planned at Merle Travis and the Ag Center when COVID-19 hit that were very positive in Muhlenberg County. Uh, we planned an outdoor classic for August uh, that was going to be kind of based on what we used to do with the Deer Classic. That, that I believe, would have been a very good program, but again, COVID-19 has slowed some of those things down or stopped them. I know at one point, uh, Dr. Mays was keeping track of uh, visitors there at the uh, Music Museum, which now, of course, includes mm -hmm. the motorsports, and I think all but three states in the country had uh, had been in the wow. museum and 17 yeah. different countries had been yeah. there. So. 17 different countries. And Dr. Mays, he does, you know, he's passionate about his job. He does such a good job with that. And, and, and our other tourism commissions, the directors, every, everyone's working hard. Yeah. And uh, it's just a very difficult time for rural it America. And it's especially difficult for Muhlenberg County. 
So we have to find ways, innovative ways, creative ways to make things work. Uh, recently, I was visiting with a judge executive in another county, and I was talking to him about us merging dispatch. And I, I just asked him, I said, frankly, may I ask what your expenses were in your dispatch services last year? And he told me, I said, what if I were to tell you that I could dispatch your folks from Muhlenberg County and save you $100,000? Would that be appealing to you? Because I can do that. And I talked to my dispatch director. I knew his numbers for call volume. I knew we could do that. And it would create a significant amount of revenue in Muhlenberg County. So we have things like that that are in the talks. And as we go forward, we're going to have to be very innovative as a community and find ways to make it work. People are not, uh, you know, they're not just going to come and hand us their industry. We're going to have to earn it. We're going to have to show them that we deserve it, that we're worthy of it. And, and, and we're going to have to do things like with the dispatch. Uh, I also talked about that same judge and even merging where I took all of his inmates and put them in our county jail because I talked to our jailer and he had assured me that he could handle the volume of inmates that we were looking at from another county. I figured what it would cost us working with our county jailer to house those inmates, gave them a price, and it makes us money, but it saves them money. So going forward, we're going to have to get really creative and, and come up with some things like that to keep Muhlenberg County moving in the right direction. Our county treasurer's been in his position for, well, I don't know how many years. I know it's been a long time. Yeah, he's been long time and he told me this is the toughest these are the toughest days that I've seen for our community and the TVA loss of revenue was the toughest hit that we've ever taken as a community so to be honest you know it's just a difficult time but I, I just I heard Norman Vincent Peale say when I was about 17 I went out to an FFA convention in Kansas City Missouri and he said I'm going to tell you something and I want you to remember it for the rest of your life and he was talking to probably 20 or 30,000 kids. He said, positive thinkers get positive results. Negative thinkers get negative results. And he said, that's a fact. Remember it the rest of your life. And I've tried to always remember that. I believe it's true. It's important to think positive, be positive, do positive things if we're going to get positive results. So I was going to ask you if you had a message for all of Muhlenberg Countyans in these tough times, what we can do together. Uh, you know, in support of not only you in the office, but in support of everybody. So I, I, I don't know if you can get any better than just think positive. Well, I, th I think that's a big key to it. And, you know, maybe we can't, con we would all like to have, I, I assume we would, a Toyota plant land here in Muhlenberg County to announce sure. next week they're coming. All of us would like that. What do we do until then? We do the best that we can with the circumstances we have. We remain positive. We keep working diligently. Collaboration is so important. We need that in our community, and, and we're seeing a lot of that. There's a lot of collaboration in this community, and I'm excited about that. It's so important. And there's little things that we can do just to make life better for people. You know, the, I can't make a Toyota plant come to uh, a site in Muhlenberg County, an industrial site. I can be kind to people. Everyone can do that. And it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is, what color you are. Everybody can be kind. Everybody can be nice. And when you do that, you make the world better for everyone. Zig, Zig, Zig Ziglar used to say, if you want to be happy, make somebody else happy. Yeah. He said, that's the key to happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot that. of truth in that. It is. I know one thing that uh, you can do at home uh, to make sure your voice is heard and, and to help Muhlenberg County uh, and the communities uh, contained therein is by uh, filling out your census form if you've not done so already. Uh, go to the website listed below and uh, fill out the census information for your household. Uh, it takes 10 minutes. At most. At uh, most it's yeah. very inf important information uh, for the county and for our community. Yeah. Curtis, yes, uh, do we have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Uh, I would like to say that if I had to sum you up in one word, I think positive would be it. Uh, so that's, yeah. that's great that you shared that. Uh, anything that you'd like to leave our uh, viewers with as we... Well, I, I, want, I want to put a word in for your beautiful auditorium here. What a great facility. And the Martin Foundation is another very positive entity in our community that helps keep this community uh, moving in the right direction. And I've been in conversations with Alyssa Manning recently in regard to the county's situation. She is so passionate about her job. And TJ, you and Sean, what you guys are doing here at, at Martin Hall is phenomenal. And I know when COVID-19 uh, uh, is, is diminishing, we'll see some more great programming here. 
this is such a great place. And thank you all for being this. This is one of those innovative things where you get information out to the public and keep the community moving in the right direction. So thanks to both of you gentlemen for all that you mean to this community. You're both five star gentlemen, and I appreciate you very much. Uh, well, uh, that's high praise indeed, it Coach Mew. So uh, we want to thank you for all you do uh, and for choosing that life of a public servant. And uh, I can think of very few that. Uh, do a better job of making sure that they are serving the public and not the other way around. So You're thanks for being here. Kind, sir. Thanks for taking some time to talk with us today. Uh, to go back to what he said, I want to thank our sponsors for all they do for us here. Uh, they are the ones that allow us to make the arts accessible to everyone. And without their uh, contributions and their support over the years, it wouldn't be possible. You know, everything that they do in the main stage season, I've said this countless times, that supports all the other things that we do with Mustang Drama, with MCTI, with Encore Dance. Uh, and so we can't thank you enough. We encourage you as, as things open back up to eat local, to shop local, uh, and to be kind to each other. As we continue to live this life, six feet apart. Six feet apart. <laughs> Get no rest. No, no. I've been down.